Yes. So it's immigrated to distant lands. Yeah. And uh, she used to run a show at a uh, uh, gallery cabaret oh, for many yourself. years. And uh, she has uh, many John, books. She publishes books, yeah. start publications. <laughs> she has a website. She's a professional performance artist and publisher, a poet, a writer, a photographer. This is the window tool. And uh, she's the editor of two uh, literary magazines and uh, leases through such as Scar's publications. And she uh, goes to the, ca the Cafe Gallery Chicago show for many years. Uh, does a poetic license on uh, lying, which I had attended before. It's um, yeah, which you have attended, yes. It's because it's not some of the Zoom meetings. It's the fluorescent. Right, um, really because the pandemic uh, closed and made the bookstore close it down, so it now runs a Zoom meeting. Isn't that funny? She's sung in three bands, has 40 plus CD releases on iTunes, Amazon, and others. And uh, she also won the Poetry Ambassador Award. Oh, wow. So we can sell as Poetry Award. <laughs> and, uh, and she uh, has been on for, for several prestigious pushcart prizes. And she, uh, prestigious. Yeah, and she uh, <laughs> runs internet radio stations and a poetry podcast. She did. Well, I did, she, not anymore. She frequents radio, national, local television. Well, I try to uh, get anywhere I can and infiltrate anything as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. So, the director of this thing? my first feature yeah. is the world renowned Janet Kuiper. Wow! Who <laughs> used to host a show here at uh, Gallery Cabaret. You know, she's much missed. And she's the publisher of Scars Publications. And uh, she uh, uh, has 100 plus books published. Yes. You know, uh, some of which I have. And uh, she also uh, hosted at the Cafe Gallery, kind of like I said, for many years. She's in Austin, Texas. Uh, has a global Zoom show now. You know? Monthly. Called Monthly, Poetic yeah. Voices. On Sundays, right? On uh, the first Sunday of every month. Cool. Right. She's sung in three bands. I can't sing well. Anyway, uh, and she also uh, has her CD releases on iTunes, Amazon, and others. And she is profiled in magazines as Nation. Wow. And uh, okay. she also won the Poetic Ambassador Award, so she can settle poetic disputes. Global and, disputes yeah, over global, poetry. Yeah, like if, uh, <laughs> if Billy, Billy Collins wants to kill somebody, she might step in and settle it. And uh, also, uh, she was a uh, Poet of the Year, and she uh, been nominated for many multiple pushcart awards, very prestigious. And she uh, has run internet radio station shows and uh, podcasts for frequency radio, national, and local television. Let's hear it for Janet. Thank you. two literary magazines through that, but I was very pleased when a Sablewit.net press based at like hot Taj Mahal press, based in India, they wanted to start publishing books of mine, and um, last year when I came here to feature, they um, published my book Shattering the Glass Ceiling, which yeah. was cool because it has poetry translated to different languages, and it's just, I thought it was excellent, but uh, then when they said they wanted another book published, um, it was right when um, Dobbs v. Jackson happened, just a little over a year ago. And so journalism Janet just went into you know hyper research mode and wrote and wrote and wrote. And uh, they published this most recent book of mine and it's titled Testament. I have copies of it here. You can purchase it through Amazon or through Cyberwits. But um, I've got a few copies in my pocket. It's in my bag here. Um, 20 bucks, you could save yourself some shipping if you want to just take it off my hands. I'd be thrilled. Um, there are four sections in this book. The first section, which is over half the book, which is the longest section of the book, is all the post roe v. Way women's rights poetry stuff. The second se uh, section of the book talks about life and death issues and, and dealing with, struggling with, considering suicide and that sort of thing. So that's a kind of heavy section as well. Um, third section is poetry that is reflective of the first book in the Old Testament, Genesis. And the last section has three short poems from that reflect sections of the most, uh, the newest book in the New Testament. And they all then tie back into, those three tie back into, uh, Revelation's poems tie back into the idea of having your rights back and all working and growing together. But anyway, I was going to share with you poems from section one, just because it's so big, and just because by living in Austin, Texas, I uh, 
I get to see firsthand a lot more situations that than anybody sees here, I think, because of the situation, the political circle that you know the Chicagoland area is in, and uh, so that was why I'd be writing so much more. So I was going to share with you a number of poems that are appearing in this section um, of of testament. The first poem I was going to share with you not only appears in the first book of testament, but it also appears in the July 2023 issue of one of the literary magazines I published, Down in the Dirt, Lonely Visitor. Lonely Visitor. Bum, bum, bum. I crammed stuff in the back when I can pull that off. So this first poem that I'm going to share is going to be in both of these books. And it is titled, Equality Doesn't Mean Removing Rights. The other day was the anniversary of the day the 19th Amendment was certified in the United States giving women the right to vote. On anniversaries past, I have reflected on how we have come a long way, baby, but we have to keep looking happy because, you know, like we must be grateful for all of women's strides that these men have let us accomplish, succeeding all while pressed under their thumb. So I thought it was funny to see that yesterday our US president called it Women's Equality Day and at the White House, they focused the day on abortion rights. How good of them to, <laughs> when another government grant branch possibly correctly um, actually decided to overturn Roe v. Wade to allow the states to decide. I don't think the entire country realized what a giant catastrophe that might be for over half of the people in this nation. Uh, I didn't know if the White House would have some sort of festival for the day or what, until I heard that they were actually meeting with state and local leaders to discuss ways to safeguard access to abortions, which has been under such duress and such peril since it seems half of these states now stole women's basic rights. In fact, the president continues, suggesting that the only way to reverse this injustice in our is in our future voting choices. So, how appropriate on the anniversary of the day we gain the right to vote that I hear his call <laughs> today of all days. <laughs> Have you ever heard the allegory, the, the story of a baby? They may seem content on their own, but show them a treat. Let them hold it for a while then abruptly take it away. That's when the baby starts crying, now robbed. And this is what goes through my head now, after women have been, made such accomplishments in life, after being held back for so long. And then, with the stroke of a pen, it seems that the floodgates have been opened for usually rural conservative white men to bring women back to the dark ages again. They say we've accomplished so much, and then I wonder, have we really? It's easier to read from the tablet, but these are all, <laughs> I have to keep showing it for everybody. Um, this is in Testament. This one is titled, It Really Is All About Choice. There are some who may argue that a fetus with no mouth to express their lack of emotion while inside a womb doesn't have a choice when a woman terminates pregnancy. So religiously infused legislators eliminate the choice of the woman, the adult, full grown, voting woman, to give that choice to something that isn't even born. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, individuals gained their choice back as press polls, press polls indicated that parents with children going to colleges and states supporting restricting women's rights are telling their children they're not going to pay for them to continue school in a state that is so restrictive to women, to adult, full-grown, voting women. If that state does not tell a young woman that they are entitled to terminate a pregnancy after a rape, I'm not sure I'd be spending my money on education in that state, if I may quote U.S. Senator Claire, Claire McCaskill. 
uh, high school students, junior year, senior year, approaching college, now reconsider college choices in these restrictive states after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I would not consider going to school in a state where abortion is against the law is only one quoted teen, but she is not alone. But what if women are already in college when sorority presidents even call this new abortion law just terrifying? But there may be a mischievous light at the end of the tunnel when even in Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, a self-described sanctuary city for the unborn, <laughs> where abortion is banned, students pass around sticks of gum in a freedom of speech zone with info on where to get medical abortion pills. <laughs> yes, it's come to this, making it look like you're sharing sticks of gum to get info about protecting women's rights. <laughs> well, that means it's come down to this for those stuck in this situation, these adult, full-grown, voting women may be able to vote for change, although I'm sure they'll escape the college states who kidnap their rights long before they see real change. What ripple effect will this overturning women's rights cause? Will school choice change? Will voting choices change? Will population numbers literally change after some in government tried to turn their country back to the dark ages? Religious people talk about seeing the light, but the repression they see is darkness for far too many women. Trust me, light they claim to see blinds them to equality for all living beings. It is not only in the cyberwit.net for testament, but it is also in the other literary magazine of the editor for CCD magazine. This is a January, April 2022 issue collection book titled A Mural of a Forest. A Mural of a Forest is also in testament, so I have to show off the books that I publish as well as the ones that other people publish. Okay? So, um, I may see somebody with the camera and I'm like, uh oh, now I'm going to mm -hmm. show it. CCD magazine was founded in 1993. The 30 year anniversary just passed, holy cow. <laughs> and so I tried to cram in some performance art stuff, so I've got this next poem in this book as well, as what Cyber did for this in uh, Testament. This poem is titled, He, You See. The world feels heavy when women have carried the weight, excelling at jobs all while hosting parties where everything seemed to just fall into place as she worked on the behind the scenes to make everything perfect. In addition to all of this, she still manages household finances, usually better than any man, and cares for a family if she chooses to have one. That's the key. You see, understanding the news of the world, knowing that her place remains so much larger than anyone can realize. <laughs> From the insect world through the animal world, women ruled over their family when matriarchs set, made sense and flourished. <laughs> Other species kill their mates after the deed is done. <laughs> but the beauty is when, without the death of a full-grown male, <laughs> these queens can then choose how their family can grow. They've managed everything else. They should be able to decide on this until a religious and conservative male-dominated government decides to take those rights away from the female sex. Suddenly, these strong women, after fighting to advance their rights, lose a most basic right over their body and their choice to men who claim to know better. These men, when men can choose to actually relinquish nearly half of their lives with weight gains and hormone changes that may force some men into a psych ward or just to relinquish their lives again for years, decades, for something they didn't want, then men can choose what's better or not, or if it's better to just cut the seed of the weed before it grows so unmanageable that they're forced to be a servant to something they never wanted. They shouldn't make that choice for the stronger female sex when it's a woman's body and a woman's choice.
home. So yeah, if you wanna, if you want to sign in, here's a sign this sheet to sign this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. Okay, so da da da. The next poem is titled "A Jihad Against Free Choice." Bypassing my poli sci school prerequisites, I, I'm sure my early U.S. high school history class taught me the Tenth Amendment clearly. Powers not stated in this Constitution, quote, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, end quote. When the United States was founded, that worked, and we were separate nation states until we made a federal reserve, until we mandated a federal income tax. And yes, Congress may have created the U.S. Army, but in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12, it states, and let me quote, the Congress shall have the power to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of monies to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. <laughs> Even though the Civil War armies existed by state, but now war becomes national. My military husband will quickly state that all recruits start their services with terms of four to eight years. So if we support our constitution so, then why do we allow our government to break it by forcing people to serve at a minimum two to four times longer than they're politically legally supposed to? Uh, my point is that even if the national government breaks its own laws, once they've created national banks, taxation, armies, that is when we lost our autonomy on it as individual nation states. We're all one now, like it or not. And the overturning of Roe v. Wade explicitly pointed out that choice is just too far for our national government. That power should remain with the states. So yeah, in principle, I get that. I don't like a national government taking my rights away, but Roe v. Wade didn't take our rights away, and after signing this one document that has given the go-ahead to let our states try and do that instead, we then learn the Christian jihad against free choice will try to force their beliefs on everyone and take rights away from over half of its people. Is that how our Constitution is supposed to work? By the people? for the people, for we, the people, don't like one religion trying to tell us what to do. Since the beginning, we've dealt with in God we trust on our money, and they changed the Pledge of Allegiance to include under God, thanks to Eisenhower, because us Americans were supposed to be better than those godless communists, though I do remember seeing far too many elaborate churches when I visited St. Petersburg. <laughs> and I'm no history buff. But now that I think about it, let's go back to that First Amendment. And I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. This is before free speech or freedom of the press. And I bring this up, the first words of the First Amendment, because over half of these United States now try to establish their religious beliefs by suppressing the rights of over half the people. Isn't that just one more thing expressly forbidden by our Constitution? <laughs> and really, I I'm no history buff, but it doesn't take much reading to find so many things going wrong after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. <sighs> it's a shame to think that we need to pass more laws just to get our rights back, because I don't think marches are going to solve this one. Granting rights to rational choices have only come after fighting tyrannical religious dogma for centuries. Our people can't wait that long. When we've had our rights, we can't go back to suppression, repression, oppression. We know better. We deserve more. And you can't fight reason forever. <laughs> this is Burt Testament, part one of the book Testament. Uh, this poem is titled, Only Considering Women's Rights. Wondering if I was the only one, wondering if anyone else considered women's rights, especially after Roe v. Wade, I watched a television interview. Okay, it was on Comedy Central. <laughs> it cut me some slack. The Daily Show back that day conducted daily interviews, usually with relevant lunchtime poll topics. 
where the 70th Miss Universe talked about how she was bullied for gaining weight. So even those who are perceived as the most beautiful are also teased. But what stuck in my head is how she was going to rural towns to make feminine pads available to young girls since many places don't even allow women access to the most basic reproductive needs. Because, well, we forget when, thanks to Obama, birth control is free in the USA, and in some parts of the world they just have it so much worse. I, I think of the third world countries who restrict women's rights so, and I, I contemplate that, hey, maybe we don't have it so bad here in the USA. That's when I have to stop myself, remind myself that we women all have these rights. Or, or wait a minute, we had these rights after fighting for them for far too long in these quote unquote United States, that if this is supposed to be the land of the free, when rights should be allowed to full grown women and not to miss menstrual cycles and not to mistakes, not human life, not living, breathing, voting human beings who do not have a heart, uh, go ahead. Consider dates of fertilization. Don't consider the person hosting cells that may one day be a human being. For these chemical reactions, if they only had a brain with cognitive reasoning, they would beg you to respect the woman first. So I was watching an interview with Miss Universe. <laughs> what an outdated symbol for the value of women. <laughs> a woman from India talking about women's rights, and it made me wonder if I was the only one, wondering if anyone considered women's rights. Hey, I love talking about women's issues so much. You have no idea how many things I've written with this one. This poem is titled, Fear for Their Safety. How women speak is interpreted under the cloak of womanhood. Well, she's just a woman. How could she say that? She doesn't know what she's talking about. So, subliminally, all women couch what they say based on who's listening to them, based on how people interpret their words. And when a woman with any authority in a workplace says something strong uh, to correct a problem at work, men will say she's being a bitch. <laughs> when a man says the same thing, he's seen as being driven. When a woman went to a doctor during menopause complaining about hot flashes, the doctor suggested giving her Xanax, <laughs> which can impair memory, judgment, or coordination, can cause paranoia or suicidal tendencies. And the doctor didn't deliver a remedy, he just prescribed her a pill to shut her up. When a woman was hospitalized with an ulcer, she came back. Her pain remained, especially during menstruation. Uh, there would be days at work when she would lay underneath her desk in pain. Once I had to help her walk her to the train station during the day because she had to be bedridden and didn't know if she could walk the one block to the train station without collapsing. She spoke of how uncomfortable she felt with her male doctor who never listened to her, dismissing her problems as if they were all in her head. Doctors later suggested that she should get on the pill, but she took that advice from a doctor years earlier and it made her more violently moody and still she had didn't help with the pain uh, she feared <laughs> her only choice was still just to follow her doctor's orders when a when a woman went to a doctor complaining of stomach pains they suggested she had a yeast infection when she knew full well it was not that and she then told them that was ludicrous and the doctor just shrugged her off Sarah sharing her problems with another doctor, he suggested that she had the stomach flu. He gave her a prescription, so she should be fine soon. Within two weeks, she was admitted to the hospital with a laceration in her stomach, it worsened because it was never treated. The strong acidic fluids were seeping through her body, infecting other organs. Admitted to a hospital on Friday. 
By Saturday morning, she was dead. <laughs> this says a lot about women's health care and how they value women. After the overturning of Roe v. Wade, women's health doctors feel increased scrutiny amid abortion bans, and patients now struggle to find access to potentially life-saving care. I read headlines like, four more Republican-led U.S. states uh, ban almost all abortions. Hmm, that's not a shocker. And uh, the link between abortion rates and gender equality. Did somebody actually need to research this to figure that one out? <laughs> I, I see these battles as South Carolina Republican women fight for abortion rights, and Kansas voting records confirm abortion rights, too. And as I seem like some sort of mad scavenger scooping up any news I can to help women in this struggle, I suddenly remember how women have been stripped of health care rights all across the spectrum from prescribing crazy pills for never listening to female patients, all leading to so much pain and death. I've seen it firsthand. How long must women fight this battle? And if women win abortion rights, do we think that everything is wonderful again? Because it never was wonderful, not for women. Continually ready to fight. It may take too long. Women may win battles, but after millennia, women lose the war. We women keep fighting, keep thinking that we're making a difference, but are we? Do we feel comfortable walking down the street at night without fearing the threat of theft or rape? Do we feel that we can stand up on our, for ourselves at work without uh, sounding like, to all men like we're just some bitch instead of an insightful, valuable contributor? Will we ever feel comfortable with a male doctor at the one place where we should feel the most safe because I wonder how women can talk about equality when in all reality women always have to fear for their safety <laughs> my last poem is what I'm being told about maybe too long trying to look at the wrong place anyway um, this one is titled expecting rights after losing rights Okay, I have heard that peaceful protests can lead to change. I mean, consider this. For years, I have purchased iodized salt from Morton's, in part because of that logo of that little girl holding the umbrella was on display <laughs> at a huge manufacturing building downtown in the city where I worked for years. And actually, when a friend of mine from England came and visited the citizen of the once British Empire, he even photographed that building. <laughs> But just once, I had to buy iodized salt from Swad because of its logo of Mahatma Gandhi holding his now iconic cane. For it's not that I ever lived through the salt march in India, but I was in India. I, I saw that man emblazoned on their money. I, I saw that march as a statue in New Delhi. So I connected with that image of protest for something as basic as salt. And I love that I am not the first to realize that peaceful protests can lead to change. But really, ladies, when some basic rights have been taken away from you, what made you think that after peaceful protesting, you would have other basic rights to help you? How silly of you. How foolish of you. You should have known better. Three different women from three different parts of these United States attended a hearing open to the public at a Supreme Court on the 2nd of November. Now, I know protesting in the Supreme Court is forbidden, despite laws guaranteeing the right to peaceful protest, so I guess it's no surprise that these women were stopped, including a 71-year-old woman who needed a cane, or a CEO who, after protesting with a single statement in court, held her hands out to show she carried no weapons. Now, as I said, I know protesting like this is illegal, but when nonviolent protests like this happen, protesters may be arrested, but they are never detained. But for those three entirely different women, they were put in ankle, waist, and wrist manacles, transferred four times in dark, tightly packed transport vehicles that were 
about 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 30 degrees Celsius, with bars over their laps and under their chins. They were jailed with no right to counsel, detained overnight in a tiny feces-laden and urine-spattered cells where they had to sit either on a metal toilet or a metal bed frame with no mattress as bright lights kept them awake all night. Yes, they're looking into their mistreatment, which is more than 30 hours of detention for, you know, that may violate the constitutional and international rights. And yes, it's not like they wanted any iodized salt rubbed into their already festering wounds. And yes, they were let go and were never actually charged. So in some senses, these jailers seem to just be able to do whatever they want. So really, when it comes down to it, ladies, you should have known better. If these primarily Bible Belt Southerners with that white male supremacy mentality who prefer to repress women can take away some of your rights, then did you really think they let you keep any sense of your own morality if you try to talk back? Because really, I'm sorry, ladies, you should have known better.